Good evening. Welcome to Midweek Evening Prayer for the week of March the 23rd. Tonight we're having a, a service that's in a somewhat Celtic style and our theme is going to be the praying for peace. Most of our prayers this evening come from John Philip Newell's Praying with the Earth, including this first one. For the sacred earth, its scents and sounds and sights, we give you thanks, O God. For the holy heavens, their heights and depths and breadth, we give you thanks. May we love the earth and cherish her fecundity. May we love the rivers and obey their ancient purity. May we love the skies and honour their infinity, and all for one another. Amen. Now a prayer of awareness for peace. It's because we long for peace that we pray. It's because we long for wholeness that we hunger. It's because we need forgiveness that we seek new beginnings. So we come, entering the depths of our souls to plead for peace, to summon wholeness, to forget, to beg forgiveness of ourselves and of one another, and thus of you, soul within our soul light within our longings. Amen. <clears throat> our first song is a chant, let my prayer rise up as incense before you. Let my prayer rise up as incense to you. Let my prayer rise up as incense. Let my prayer rise up as incense to you. Let my prayer rise up as incense. Let my prayer rise up as incense to you. Let my prayer rise up as incense. Before we get to our scripture, I just point out that since the invasion of Ukraine by Russia last month, I've been trying to comment on scriptural analogies, to try to see the relevance of the gospel to these events. This evening, I want to consider some analogies with the beheading of John the Baptist by King Herod, because it happens to be our lectionary reading for evening prayer tonight. And so our scripture is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. King Herod had sent men to arrest John. They bound him and put him in prison. This was because Herod had married Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. John had told Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a grudge against John and wanted to have him killed. But Herod feared John because John was a righteous and holy man, and also because Herod liked to talk to him and listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod gave a banquet on his birthday for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will grant it. He solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. The girl went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? And she replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, the girl rushed back to the king and requested this. I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, Herod sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. The guard beheaded John in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. As I reflect on the story, two things strike me immediately. The obvious one is that John the Baptist lost his head, literally, for speaking out made for saying that the behavior of Herod and Herodias was immoral. I've spoken about that before. So this evening I also want to talk about the idea of thinking things through, about looking before you leap. 
Herod made a promise to Herodias' daughter. Infatuated and probably drunk, he offered her anything he wanted, anything, no limits. And when the girl asked for the head of John the Baptist, Herod couldn't refuse. His honor was at stake. As I think about the dreadful situation in Ukraine, I can't help thinking also about the role that Western democracies played, however unwittingly, in bringing it about. It goes back a long way. One aspect is the failure of the West to do anything about Russian aggression throughout the century. Russian behavior in Grozny, Chechnya, again in Syria, in support of Bashir al-Assad. And in both cases, there was utter disregard for human life and suffering. And in Syria, there was also failure to respond to crossing of so-called red lines. Then in 2014, there was the annexation of Crimea. It caused a mere tut-tutting. So why wouldn't Vladimir Putin think he can get away with whatever he wants? His stated quest is the rebuilding of the Soviet Empire. Bring it on. So, like Herodias and her daughter, our Western nations aren't blameless. And the reason is greed. Russian oligarchs, associates, cronies of Putin, have laundered their ill-gotten gains in Russia by buying up property in the West. Mansions in London, New York, Toronto. For luxury cars, jewelry and yachts, our governments have been happy to look the other way accept these so-called investments, which have been called sewers of dirty money. Yet England, for example, seems to be mainly obsessed by the fate of Chelsea Football Club, which is owned by the oligarch Abramovich. And Canada hardly has clean hands here. Just last week, the Globe and Mail pointed out that our, hand, our laws on shell companies allow so-called investments in Canada to be made by people who are not named. It makes me wonder how many other companies are like Everaz, the company that's controlled by Abramovich, that's making the steel pipes for the federally owned Trans Mountain Pipeline. So is greed in Europe becoming overly dependent on one major supplier of energy, namely Russia? In Germany especially, by teaming up with Gazprom to build the two Nord Stream gas pipelines, with the prospect of avoiding transit fees to Ukraine for Russian natural gas. Now, oh my goodness, who ever would have thought that we can't sanction Russian gas, otherwise our people won't be able to heat their homes. Sanctions or no sanctions, we have to keep paying Russia for it. And by the way, we also can't keep our nukes running because we made a promise to shut them down. That's the same reason Herod couldn't say no to Herodias' daughter. I'm not trying to justify what Vladimir Putin has done and is doing. But if you were a somewhat deranged and highly egotistical dictator, you might well have concluded that the invasion of Ukraine was likely to have very little downside. Our reflection song is a version of Psalm 130. Out of the depths have I cried unto you. Lord, hear my voice. Oh, let your ears consider well the voice of my complaint. If you, Lord, were to note what is done amiss, God, who could stand before you? But there is forgiveness with you, and therefore we stand in awe. I look for the Lord, my soul waits for the Lord, and also do I trust. My soul looks for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. Yes, more than watchman for the morning. Oh, trust in the Lord, 
for with the Lord there is mercy, and also plentiful forgiveness. The Lord shall save the people from all their sins. As we return to prayers, we have a prayer for living in peace, again by John Philip Newell. May our enemy become our friend, O God, that we may share us goodness. May our enemy, enemy become our friend, O God, that our children may meet and marry. May our enemy become our friend, O God, that we remember our shared birth in you. May we grow in grace. May we grow in gratitude. May we grow in wisdom that our enemy may become our friend. Amen. And now we have a very beautiful prayer it was written by Pope Francis. God of all creation, we thank you for all your good gifts, especially the many resources that are available to us to live happy and healthy lives. Because of our attachments, our greed and our tendency to complicate things, we pray that you might give us grace to see things differently, to clear away the obstruction of our attachments so that we might be attentive to loving people more than possessions liberate us from greed and overconsumption so we can care for our common home and all of your creatures. Free us from unnecessary busyness and worry so that we might use our time well for your glory and not ourselves. We know that this will not be easy. We need your grace. Give us the courage to resolutely commit to living together in a simpler, more sustainable way. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now the collect. Lord of all existence, your word brings peace and calm to fearful hearts and minds. Surprise our complacency through the wonder of your creation and bring us to new faith and trust in you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now a Celtic version of the Lord's Prayer. Our heavenly creator, may your name be praised in all the world. May we follow what we perceive to be your will today and every day. Give us bread enough for today. Keep us in your straight path and help us to forgive all those who have hurt us in any way. Now we, and may we be kept free from all temptations and always remember to offer you praise and glory. Amen. The closing prayer. O oh God, you've given us the joys and the challenges of this day. Now as the shadows lengthen and the evening comes, we ask for a quiet night and a holy and refreshing time of sleep. And then when the day returns and renewed through the wellsprings of your grace, lead us, O oh God, on the journey of justice and guide us, O oh God, on the pathway of peace. Amen. Final blessing again from John Philip Newell's book. In the coming hours of darkness, may there be light in our dreams. In the stillness of sleep, may there be strength in our souls. In the wakeful watches of night, may there be peace in our minds, light for new vision, strength to make sacrifice, peace for our world. On the pathways of Earth's journey this night, let there be peace. Amen.